Hello, I'm Ben Rottenberg. We are here at the Scripps Institution in La Jolla, California, the largest and oldest center for marine research in the world. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. President John F. Kennedy, best known as a champion for exploration of outer space, also called on Americans to tap the ocean's depths. And yet, today we know more about the surface of our dead moon than the bottom of our own oceans, which may be teeming with almost alien life. Joining us to navigate through the waters of oceanographic study are Don Walsh, co-pilot of the Trieste, the deepest manned underwater mission to date and former dean of the Institute for Marine and Coastal Studies at the University of Southern California, Ed Freeman, director of this Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. Sylvia Earle, former chief scientist at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration and author of Sea Change. And Edward Miles, professor of marine studies and public affairs at the University of Washington and the United Nations lead expert on maritime environmental protection. The topic before this house, uncharted waters, this week on Think Tank. Three quarters of the world is covered by water, and yet we know surprisingly little about our oceans. Scientists here and many others around the world are trying to change that. They study ocean currents and patterns to help predict weather and natural disasters. They seek answers about how the Earth was formed, and they search for mineral resources and new medicines. Just one example, recently scientists discovered a compound from deep sea bacteria just a thousand feet off the California coast, which may inhibit the growth of the HIV virus. Today, explorers are excited about the race to the bottom. In recent years, scientists have discovered bizarre creatures from the previously inaccessible depths of the oceans. Until only a few years ago, scientists did not believe such creatures could live on this planet. Some of our guests today have actually been down there. Lady and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Let me begin with you, Sylvia Earle. What do we know about these oceans today that we didn't know 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Well, in my lifetime, I think it's safe to say that we've learned more about the oceans than all preceding history. And most of that is concentrated in the last few decades. Uh, and it's increasing, the rate of uh, accumulating new insights. But I think, on balance, the most important new insight that we've gained about the sea is the magnitude of what we don't know, the All magnitude right. of our ignorance. <laughs> Ed, Ed, Ed Freeman. I'd like to uh, focus on issues involving global scales, because we're beginning to have the uh, technology through satellites, high-speed communications, New, new ways of doing things to be able to understand the Earth as a, as a total system. And we've learned an enormous amount, for example, just in the last months about acoustic propagation between here and New Zealand. What, what does that mean, acoustic propagation? We're going to have to get our terms straight here. This, we, uh, because not only is, won't our viewers understand it, your hosts won't understand uh, it. This right? is use of sound as a probe through the oceans uh, projected from uh, up near Monterey and are detected and listened to through the oceans in New Zealand. And the signals have come through more crisply than we ever believed. And it's telling us something about the structure of the ocean which we never knew before. All right, uh, Don Walsh. The thing that impresses me the most, and I'm more of an engineer and, and physical scientist, it is the biological biological reality that there's a new life uh, system on our planet. Uh, if we were taping this program 20 years ago, we couldn't have had this discussion. We would have assumed that the entire uh, life system on our planet depended on the sun through the process of transferring the solar energy to the plants and to people via uh, photosynthesis through the plants. And now we discover this entire parallel, separate life system in the 
deep parts of the ocean that is fueled up by the Earth's heat energy coming into the uh, sea floor and the deep ocean and creating a, a uh, entire life system that is uh, chemosynthetic rather than photosynthetic. And now some of the recent work suggests that this may have been the original life forms on our protoplanet when it was first formed four and a half billion years ago. And that the biomass of this type of life system may exceed that on the surface of our planet. To me, that's very exciting. And we're and talking within 15 years. And you were down there. You, 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 I, you still hold the record for the deepest Yes, descent? I do, but it was not on a dive I made, but I'm familiar with the program, the Woods Hole's uh, mm -hmm. Alvin Submersible, and they were on a geological mission. So unintended consequences. Not a biologist on the right. ship, not a biologist in the submersible. They had to go get them and bring them back. Okay. Uh, Ed Miles, what, what is your... Uh what is the thing we know now that we, that we didn't know? Pushing on from Don's comment, I would generalize it, uh, especially in context of the discovery about possible 3.8 billion year old fossils uh, on Mars, and say that these discoveries allow us to hypothesize that there are very large microbial biomass systems on most if not all planets and that they're associated with volcanoes and water in some form. That's the really exciting thing that the youngest hottest areas of our planet in these spreading centers where the tectonic plates pull apart at the bottom of the ocean contain such large colonies of microbes of great potential interest to industry. I think it's one of the best things that could have happened to the ocean, that life was discovered on a rock that came from Mars, or evidence of life. Mars and Earth and the rest of the solar system is about the same age, and we date life on this planet back to three and a half billion years or so ago. And look what's happened. I mean, this microbes still dominate, although we like to think we're the big boss. <laughs> the microbes, that's where the action is. But look what else has happened here. This place is chock-a-block full of diverse life forms. This place meaning the ocean. This place, Earth, this planet, but right. especially the oceans. The greatest diversity of life, no question, hands down, is in the ocean. All the major divisions of plants how, how and animals time, have some representation out there. How, how much time, Sylvia, have you spent in the, in the ocean down deep? Well, not nearly enough. It uh, comes to something in excess of 6,000 hours diving so far in submarines and underwater habitats and just plain snorkeling or diving around, mostly diving with scuba, but you, know, you rack up hours very fast when you live underwater for a uh -huh. while. Don Walsh, uh, I, I can't let you uh, stop without telling us at least briefly what it, what it was like down there. How deep were you, 30,000 feet? Uh, 35,800. And, and this was 35 years ago? A uh, third of a century. It makes me feel younger than 35 right. years ago. <laughs> have, have, have people compared you to Neil Armstrong? I mean, is that, is that a correct uh, I, I don't. Comparison? Not, not many, I'm not sure. Many. This, I do. This, you do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. This was kind of a stealth thing, and the story's too long for this program, but the Navy did not want us to uh, 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 seek publicity for this particular event. Bluntly, the Navy had promised a lot of scientific spectaculars, including the first satellite and these things were crashing into Canaveral Bay in great flashes of flame. So when I, as a, a young Navy lieutenant, showed up with my plan to merely go to the deepest place in the world ocean with it. Which was where? Uh, near Guam, Mariana's Trench. Um, the Navy said, well, that's very interesting. You go do it, and then if you're successful, uh, we'll tell the world. We'll so <laughs> it, it was not a very well-publicized thing, but that was... Um, in the uh, Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench about 200 miles from the island of Guam. That gives you a clue though about the magnitude of our ignorance now. Don Walsh and his pal Jacques Picard are the only two people in all of history who have made a successful round trip to the deepest part of the sea. One way is easy. It's the round trip that counts. That defines ocean engineering. It's yeah, the round that's trip, right. right. But think of it. Here we are. We're sending probes to Mars and beyond our own the edge of our solar system and outside of our own solar system 
but we cannot even successfully get to the bottom of the ocean on a regular routine basis and it's only seven miles I can say with a straight face because I traveled seven miles to get here sure. today what, what, what is <laughs> above, the problem above getting, it, it, going the, up the technological problem is the intense pressure down there yeah, but there's there's no real technical yeah. problems. It's a matter of will, of curiosity, <laughs> uh, uh, national investment. It, it, is what you are all interested in uh, pure science or applied science? That is a really overworked <laughs> distinction, <laughs> yeah. I think. Where do you draw the line? Uh, excuse me <laughs> yeah. for answering. No, no, yes. right. no, not either or. Let me let me try to answer you, right, see, right. because I think there was recently a study that Frank Press led, the former president of the National right. Academy of Science, a very uh, interesting study of, of what science is all about and he said we are blurring the distinctions between basic and applied research and what we're talking about spans both and so you can ask the question is it basic is applied it's both it is always yes. much of what goes on in the ocean domain has public policy implications by its very nature it's applied in that sense from the perspective of the researchers it's basic but it's both. And so we need to know. We need to know. The, Absolutely. The space program uh, secured billions and billions of dollars of public funds in some measure because they claimed uh, immediate public benefit, be it from Teflon or the Tang, the orange or juice thing. Or, or, <laughs> or, or defense, certainly. Uh, w w was that sort of a, uh, a publicity trick? Of for, course uh, it was. It's marketing. We went to the moon because <laughs> the Soviets, we wanted to prevent the Soviets getting there first because they were successful before we were in orbiting the planet. Had, had, had there been no Soviet Union, do you think we might have gone to the ocean bottoms before the moon? I, d I don't know. One, one can't say that, but we certainly would not have gone to the moon on the timetable we did. Ben, look, there, there is something about the human spirit of exploration. We want to explore the planets, we want to explore yeah. space, we want to explore the deeps of the ocean. So, yeah, it may have been a publicity stunt, but I think there's something bigger uh, involved and something more majestic and grand in this exploration of both space and the world around us. I mean, <laughs> is, is it, I mean, the, the old, the old riddle, what is it, from the Kilimanjaro story, you know, why do you go there? Because it's there. Right. It is, is, no. is that what, there, there's is, that a why sense you, is that why you go there? Because it's oh, there? That's, a, that's, I think, inherent in being a human being. Uh -huh. I'm a kid, uh, everybody around here, kid in various shapes, sizes, etc. Scientists don't lose their curiosity, that sense of exploration. But we are at a point right now in our history, in global history, that is of critical significance. We have seen parallel with this great era of discovery, of understanding more about how the planet ticks, more changes that we can attribute to ourselves. Hold up the mirror. What have we as citizens of this planet done to change the nature of the place? The oceans, particularly, through what we're putting into the sea and through what we're taking out, huge quantities of wildlife are being removed from the ocean, changing the basic structure, the character of the, of the living systems there, and therefore changing our life support system. Are, are My you concern, talking principally about fisheries? Is that what Fisheries, through what we're taking out, through what we're putting in, the changes that we're causing, that we are causing, through what we put into the atmosphere that falls back on land and sea alike. There's no line that says, don't go in the ocean. <laughs> what is in the atmosphere comes back throughout the entire global system. Do, and there, do you there, have there, reason to think this is harmful? I would rather err on the side of caution. We're adding new materials to the, well, but, the but oceans. I mean, that we don't, we don't know what the consequences but, but what is are. Causing, <laughs> what is causing what you are describing are the forces of modernism which are making life better for people here on earth. I mean I can counter that by saying if we are on the side of caution we are hurting people who are alive now who are trying to do better through the, for the very forces of science yeah. that you all represent. Not necessarily. There are patterns of use of natural environments which cannot be sustained indefinitely. If we add up for, for, for example any commercial fishery can put its targets at risk, or most of them, 
by the process of overfishing, which comes about as a result of a failure to control the amount of fishing effort mm -hmm. effectively. I think what we're all saying <clears throat> is that in order to understand the planet as a total system, yeah. which we must understand to uh, bring about a consonance between economics, between environmental issues, between equity, as a development out into the future 50 years from now, it's not enough to understand oceanography and physics and chemistry and geography and economics. astronomy and economics and so on. It's all part of an integrated whole. And Human we are culture. beginning to get our arms around it. The kind of research that Ed and his colleagues do is critical to that understanding. Astronauts have given us this view of the Earth as never before. That's something new in our lifetime that has changed our perspective forever. Looking at other planets in the way that we now do and finding the possibility of life elsewhere has changed our perspective. We're getting at some of the big questions such as where do we come from and where are we going and how are we going to get there? How are we going to ensure that we have a future at least as successful as some of the Oh, citizens out there in the ocean, the sharks that have been around for 300 million years, and our history goes back maybe 5 million, or our culture, civilization, maybe 10,000 years. And we'd like to be able, given our great knowledge, let's hope we have some wisdom sort of in there somewhere as well, to take all this information and plot a course for the future. What, one let, brief, let, 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 let me ask that. It reminded me of something Marshall McLuhan once said, and that was that on spaceship Earth, there are no passengers, we're all crew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we are all responsible for taking care of this manned satellite that we live on. And uh, uh, it all comes down to a question of ocean awareness. If there's no public will, then there's no government investment. If there's no government investment, there's no good science. All right, um, you said the magic word, investment. Uh, <laughs> how much do we need? Equal time with the space program would be a good start. Be a good what, start. what is that involved? What, what, what well, are the one, numbers? One shuttle launch is about a billion dollars. The entire national commitment, government financing of ocean science is about half that. How much is space getting annually now? NASA's budget is about 12 billion per big, year. Big B. Big, yeah, yeah big, big B. B. Yeah. Total and, ocean and, sciences across all of the agencies, basic research and applied, which then includes Navy, is probably a billion, billion and a half, yeah, but yeah. that includes weapon systems and things of this sort. But, but the kind of ocean research that one generally thinks of is, is the national commitment to, to uh, so, civilian so, so ocean you science looking, is about half a billion. So, so you are looking for a mere bagatelle, ten billion dollars a year? No, no. We probably couldn't the, spend the, that we'd much. We'd waste ten uh, billion a year. Mm -hmm. If, if you well, put you would, I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, you're saying the, the, the difference between what oceans are getting and space is getting is a give or take a few well, billion dollars in there, about ten billion the, dollars a year. But the right? space missions are, are, are helping us yes, because they, they are. are launching things which we use. Mm -hmm. So yep. it's, you have to be careful about how you count it. Seeing this, this whole question of, of uh, looking at uh, the global uh, ocean atmosphere interaction, the global warming, sea level rise, the whole question there. Uh, you have to have platforms that can essentially sample data faster than or at the same rate these processes are happening. With the ocean, the atmosphere interacting, you can't do this by conventional ships or, or even aircraft. The only thing that can kind of freeze frame this dynamic process between the oceans and the atmosphere so we can really figure out what's happening on a global basis, space platforms. And so they are very, very unique. There is a, uh, a school of thought in the public policy community that the uh, enormous amount of publicity that has gone to the idea of global warming is at least in some measure uh, politicized uh, and purposefully hyped by environmentalists, I guess, seeking a role or seeking a new catastrophe of the week or whatever. Where, where do you all come out on that? I think you can answer very simply. What if they're wrong? Things in the ocean happen very gradually, almost imperceptibly. And once you discover you've got a problem, it's sometimes too late. Uh, and our government runs on a two, four, six year cycle. <laughs> We're talking about 20, 50, 100 year problems. The principal argument is maybe we're on a spike. 
we don't have a long enough uh, time sample. TOPEX uh, satellite is showing every year a rise in sea level, but it's only four years, isn't it, that we've got the sample. So we realize we need a longer timeline, but you have to come back to the, the basic question, what if you're wrong? The flip side. Shouldn't you be more conservative? Well, the other um, question, of course, is, you know, what if you're right? I mean, uh, who was the, the character in mythology who couldn't hold back the ocean in any event? <laughs> all right, mean, if, oh, if, we if we're wrong, yeah. Yeah. then all we've done is spent some of the public treasure to accelerate our knowledge of the Earth atmospheric system. Nothing wrong with that. H how do you deal with this question, which we hear over and over again, is that there are poor children in America, in the ghettos, in the barrios. We're cutting back welfare. We're cutting back uh, the amount of dollars spent on public schooling and so on and so forth. Every dollar you take to go into a submersible to go down and look at the pretty fishes uh, is taking dollars from those kids. Well, that just isn't true. <laughs> I mean, well, there are no they excuse me. Air, no, no, yeah. Well, I mean, there are a finite number of dollars, yes, and if you but, uh, put them down at the bottom I, of the ocean, I, you're not putting I, them if together. If I add up all the pork barrel projects that have been put in for th for things in a particular district, it overwhelms. I mean, I could feed every kid in America. So, I mean, it's not a fair comparison. Yeah. Then, uh, the the funds just aren't fungible. How is somebody uh, supposed to make a judgment between? Uh, competing interests that come to the public policy arena to Washington and say, you just don't get it. This is really important. This is really I mean, important. Uh, well, I, the oceans I, as, are as a cornerstone of what makes the planet tick. The but, oceans are in trouble, mm -hmm. therefore so Why are shouldn't we. we do this internationally, uh, with, with, with international funds? We are, we do. Yeah, we are, but we should do more. Most large-scale programs are international programs. Mm -hmm. No one country has the resources to do it all. But we ought also to recognize that the modern global economy is an economy that runs on research and development and the results therefrom, that is scientific research and technical development, and, and on information. And if we don't keep up, we fall behind. What is the, the public policy argument uh, about whether to just go down or way down. I mean, what what is the cutoff Why figure? No, no, Thir Thirty thousand the, uh, the, the five public miles. policy criteria should be focus on fundamental processes, processes yeah. and have a mixed portfolio. Right. Yep. Those are the two most critical. Points. Well, but but, but wait a minute, let me get to the specific argument. There are people who say that ninety-seven percent of the ocean is is not very deep in, 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 in this language. It's within 6,000 meters. Within 6,000 meters, and then there's 3% that's below that. An area the size of the United States is below that, so it's trivial. Well, yeah, but, 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 but it, it costs much, much, much oh, more money a, to get way down than to no. do the other. Is that correct? No. It is not correct? No. no. Not no. with robotic vehicles. Or even no. with manned vehicles. Even with manned vehicles. No, it's just a mindset. It is two-thirds of the maximum depth of the world ocean. The, the 20,000 foot or 6,000 meter mark. And it's attractive to engineers and, and uh, bean counters because you say, well, look, for two thirds, I get 98%. What a deal. Yeah. And uh, for another. Well, but Sylvia's uh, saying that, that you, you, it's, it's, it's no big difference. That's it's, the truth. I'm uh, talking about the unwashed uh, common see. argument you hear. The perception. The, the fact which, is which that. Which your for, host presented. Well, right. uh, and I'm glad <laughs> you did. The, right. the, the last third is, as she said, an area the size of the United States. It's like uh, the metaphor she's used before about being able to climb to nearly the top of all the highest mountains, but excluding the top 2% of all the mountains of the world. Why bother? That would sound <laughs> silly to terrestrial uh, uh, in, uh, investigators, scientists, explorers. You, you're locked out of the top 2% of the mountain peaks. Okay, thank you, uh, Sylvia Earle, uh, Edward Freeman, Don Walsh, and Edward Miles and thank you. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. 
To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Watt. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.